Every year, between 500 and 3,000 people go missing in Alaska. This is twice the U.S. national average. Giving Alaska's population, this means four or five of every 1,000 people go missing each year. Of course, there are many missing person cases involving tourists rather than Alaskan residents, so we should take that figure somewhat with a pinch of salt, but it's disturbing nonetheless, especially considering a huge number of these cases remain unsolved years or decades later. Individuals and even entire aircraft disappear without a trace. In this video, we're going to look at some of the reasons why the missing person rate is believed to be so high, and then we'll discuss some specific cases. Most of these are unsolved, so it's important to raise awareness for these cases. Before we start this, be sure to slap that like button and subscribe if you're new. This is going to be one doozy of a video. Shout out and much love to my friend Justine Perry. She helped me write this script up and did a lot of work, so definitely show her some love in the comments. Now, let's jump into the many mysteries of the Alaskan Triangle. A lot of disappearances and strange occurrences happen in a place called the Alaskan Triangle, or the Alaskan Bermuda Triangle as many may know it. The Alaskan Triangle connects Alaska's largest city, Anchorage, in the south to Juneau, in the southeast panhandle of Utkivik, a northern coastal town formerly known as Barrow. As you can see, the triangle covers a large portion of the state. In mid-May, the sun rises in Utkivik and doesn't set again for about three months. In mid-November, the sun sets and doesn't rise until late January. This phenomenon is actually a natural thing known as polar night. In winter, gloveless fingers can fall victim to frostbite in just minutes. This goes to show the absolute detrimental terrain people have to live through while out in Alaska. These challenging conditions often make search and rescue operations nearly impossible to conduct without any sort of issue or hiccup. This brings us to our first and most undeniable reason for missing persons cases being so high in Alaska. Over half of the United States land that is designated for just wilderness and conservation is actually located within Alaska's borders. The Wilderness Act was established in 1964, and this set apart many millions of acres to be saved and, you know, used for national parks and all kinds of cool stuff in the country. But 57 million of those acres are in Alaska. On top of this, there's additional land in Alaska that isn't officially protected as wilderness, but it's been untouched by man and is pretty much unlivable for us. Alaska contains over 100 volcanoes, some of which are active today, 12,000 rivers, and 3 million lakes. Alaska has more inland water than any other state and more coastline than all of the other states combined. Another fun fact, 5% of Alaska is actually covered in glaciers. The third highest cause of death in Alaska is accidental injury. It's not really surprising considering the vast and treacherous landscape we have just gone over. Accidental deaths include falling down mountains and slipping through crevices, the space in between glaciers. Crevices can be so deep that a person will never be found. More common incidents include car accidents and stuff like that, of course, often caused by challenging weather conditions. Drowning is also a very common way to die in Alaska. Cold temperatures cause bodies to sink to the bottom like a rock, making it very hard to retrieve them. Now, of course, Alaska is known for its very cold climate, but this is ridiculous. It regularly falls between negative 20 and negative 50 degrees under zero Fahrenheit. That's like regular stuff for them every single day. Sometimes it even goes under negative 50 or lower. That's absolute insanity, I'm sorry. Temperatures this low can cause many hazards, like ice fog, an eerie-looking phenomenon that occurs when tiny ice particles freeze in the air. High summer temperatures surprisingly present their own set of dangers. When the warm air comes in, they trigger severe thunderstorms. In 2019 alone, tens of thousands of lightning strikes were noted between a two-week period in Alaska. With all this in mind, it's not too hard to see how unexperienced or unprepared campers and hikers may go lost. Even on common trails or in the wilderness, people go missing all the time in Alaska. Even experienced outdoorsmen have been known to struggle and even disappear. So the outlook is especially grim for the naive. If you're planning a hike, just make sure you have the relevant and necessary equipment to do so and the skill that you will need. I know a lot of people are like, swamp. 
they're hiking, you're just walking up a hill or through some woods, you'd be very surprised how crazy the terrain and footholds can get when you're not paying attention and when you're not used to walking across certain types of terrain. Trust me, you need to be safe and you need to take these things serious. Be sure to thoroughly research the place you're going to, and be sure to make sure at least one person knows your exact route. So if anything ever did happen, the search can be focused and be on the right place at the right time so they have the best chance of getting you out of there alive. A story that demonstrates just how deadly the Alaskan landscape can be comes from Nome, a northwestern town on the coast of the Bering Sea. For decades, the ongoing disappearances of both locals and tourists got some worrisome people thinking that there was alien activity involved. This inspired the 2009 sci-fi horror movie The Fourth Kind, which is set in Nome. It's a great movie, I highly recommend checking it out. In the 90s, a more widely held view was that a serial killer was at large. It reached the point that the FBI was brought in to investigate. They concluded there wasn't a serial killer, but rather alcohol consumption combined with brutal weather was to blame. Alaska has many alcohol-free communities, so Nome, where alcohol isn't prohibited, became somewhat of a party destination. Nome is a remote town that isn't part of the Alaskan road system, meaning the main way in or out is by air or water. In winter, temperatures fall to between minus 10 and minus 50 Fahrenheit. Although it's possible some of the disappearances could have been murders, the majority were ruled out by drunken misadventure. In such harsh conditions, intoxicated people are susceptible to freezing to death or getting lost or injured in the snow very easily. Wild animals found in Alaska include moose, black bears, grizzlies, polar bears, and wolves. Of course, there are many other fauna around. Interestingly enough, there are three times the amount of moose than there are bears in the state. And there are several mind-boggling laws about moose in Alaska. For example, it's actually illegal to whisper in somebody's ear while moose hunting. It's also illegal to give a moose an alcoholic beverage, or to push a live moose out of an airplane. I mean, these things are kinda obvious, but like, why are they laws? And first of all, I wanna know who the heck pushed a moose out of a plane that made this law even remotely applicable. I just hope I didn't ruin your plans this weekend to go drinking with your local wildlife. Going back to the main topic at hand, moose aren't really thought to be much more dangerous than bears. But due to their insane numbers in the states, they are actually considered the main threat when it comes to human and animal encounters and attacks. Moose injure anywhere between 5 and 10 people annually in Alaska, which is actually more than black bear and grizzly attacks combined. Wolf attacks on humans are extremely rare. The death of 32-year-old Candace Burner is unfortunately a tragic exception. In 2010, she was set upon by at least two wolves while she was out for a hike, Chignik Lake a small fishing village about 500 miles away from Anchorage. Although this incident was terrifying for the locals at large, such attacks are incredibly rare as we stated, especially fatal ones. Candace Burner's death was the second case of healthy wolves attacking a human being in modern North America, the last one being in Canada in 2005. Statistics for moose, bear, and wolf attacks are so low that it is honestly very unlikely that they are attributing to thousands of missing persons cases especially nearly hundreds every single year. Of course, recorded cases only go as far as bodies that have been found. You can't tell how many people actually were attacked by animals and drug away or eaten entirely. So bears, wolves, etc. could be a part of some of these numbers, but I think it's unlikely that they are the main part of these numbers. In such vast wilderness, people could have fallen or have been dragged into such areas that search and rescue teams could not find or just not accessible to them. Assuming they didn't hike to those areas themselves, of course. However, with animal attacks being so low and missing persons rates being so high, it is very doubtful that animal attacks are a major reason behind these missing persons cases. But there is no doubt that they do contribute somewhat. Even so, it's always important to read up on the predators in areas you may be hiking or camping in just so you are protected and you are prepared in case of an encounter. Now, let's move on to some more conspiracy-filled reasons behind the strange phenomenon in the Alaskan Triangle. There is a growing group of people who believe that animals are indeed attacking people in Alaska, but not the animals we just went over. They're thinking they might be a bit more squatchy.
Bigfoot, also known as Sasquatch, are large, humanoid creatures that are said to be covered from head to toe in thick hair. Bigfoot hasn't been proven to exist by science quite yet, but there have been thousands upon thousands of alleged encounters with this creature all across North America and the globe. The uncharted wilderness of the Alaskan Triangle is a perfect hiding place for such a creature to be existing in without anybody ever knowing. You can almost say the Alaskan Triangle would be a paradise for a cryptid to hide out. There actually have been an alarming amount of Bigfoot reports in Alaska itself. Many of these experiences, though, kind of go against the belief of many cryptozoologists who think Sasquatch are more on the docile end. Of course, these reports are incredibly difficult to verify, and it's far more likely that a missing persons case was caused by some sort of weather or mishap in their adventure. But it is interesting to look at these Bigfoot claims nonetheless. The Alaskan Hairy Man is an Alaskan legend about a 10-foot tall hairy creature creature. Many locals say it resembles that of an ape, and they think it descended from a species known as the Tornits. One version of the legend goes that the Inuit people and the Tornits lived in relative peace, until one day an Inuit youth killed a Tornit for damaging his boat. This caused the Tornits to disown humans entirely, and since then, hunters have either vanished without trace or have turned up mutilated. Other stories claim malevolent Sasquatch spirits hunt these woods. This could explain why the Sasquatches that are being reported in these areas aren't very nice. In 1943, a man was allegedly attacked by an unknown creature 18 miles down the Yukon River, down the river from the town of Ruby. The creature that allegedly attacked him was said to be chased off by his team of dogs. Unfortunately, the man would later die of internal injuries. The problem with individual accounts like this is that they're incredibly hard to verify or give much credence to at all because all we have to go off is one person's word or even a small group's word. And things can get distorted very easily. Have you ever played that game in school where you whisper one thing into somebody's ear and then by the time it makes it around the whole circle, you're hearing something completely different from them what you told them originally? That's essentially how these stories kind of get passed around and become bigger and bigger, if you get what I mean mean. But again, not to say Bigfoot isn't a thing, I just have to make these things very clear and apparent in these videos because I never want to be insensitive and lean towards an idea that might come off as disingenuous. One of the more curious cases is that of Port Chatham, also known as Portlock, a small village on the Kenai Peninsula. Apparently in the 1900s, Bigfoot sightings were so commonplace in this area that villagers constantly lived in terror of these creatures, torn up bodies regularly washed up upon the shore, and many villagers were blaming these deaths on these Sasquatch-like creatures. In this area, they were locally referred to as the Nantanak. Some villagers even claimed to see a ghostly woman in all black roaming around those cliffs. Sometime in the 1940s, this is actually some of the craziest thing I've ever seen, apparently the entire village just got up and fled the area because they were so terrified of what was going on. With the town's post office officially closing between 1950 and 1951, Portlock remains a ghost town to this very day. Although Sasquatch claims cannot be verified here either. This case is more disturbing than usual because an entire population up and left an area. Was something else going on in Portlock? That's entirely possible. I mean, with it being so far away from the mainland of America, I guess a lot of things could get skewed. But that doesn't mean that there wasn't some sort of Bigfoot-like creature terrorizing these people. I mean, clearly something was going down to make an entire population of people up and leave and then never return. Bigfoot isn't the only mystical creature thought to inhabit Alaska. The Kushtaka, also known as the Otter Man, is a shape-shifting demon. The legend of the Kushtaka is believed to originate with the native Klingit people. The Otter Man is known to lure people to the water by mimicking the screams of women or children before stealing the souls of its victims. The lost are thought to be particularly susceptible. The Kushtaka is a creature of folklore. Rational skeptics are understandably reluctant to believe it has any bearing on missing person rates but it's worth mentioning because of how heavily associated the Kustak is with the Alaskan Triangle. And like Sasquatch, although we can't prove these creatures exist, neither can we say they don't. There have been countless UFO reports in the Alaskan Triangle, as well as alien-related conspiracy theories. For example, in his 1997 book, Remote Viewers, The Secret History of America's Psychic Spies, Jim Schnabel 
writes of a secret alien base in Mount Hayes, where apparently similar events to what you see in Stranger Things occurred. In 1986, a Japanese cargo plane traveling from Iceland to Anchorage was allegedly followed for over 400 miles by unidentified flying objects. The crew reported being pursued by flashing lights. Even air traffic controllers picked up something unidentifiable on their radar, apparently as close as five miles from the plane. The pilot claimed they saw one mothership and two other smaller ships flying. Apparently, these ships were appearing and reappearing out of thin air. According to the pilot, this was happening in such an abrupt manner that it was unearthly. All attempts to evade, maneuver, and get away from these UFOs were fruitless. They tried flying at lower altitudes, doing various different turns, bobs, weaves, every kind of crazy thing you could possibly do in a plane at the time, and these things just kept following them right on their tail, but never getting too close. The pilot even joked at one point that maybe the aliens wanted their cargo, which was apparently a fancy French wine. This is just the tip of the iceberg, though. There are honestly too many theories, alien UFO sightings, and more to even remotely put in this video, or we would be here for multiple hours. But with such a high amount of individuals, and even aircraft vanishing without a trace, some people truly believe that natural dangers can't explain them all. I want to know what you guys think in the comments. Do you think it's possible that the Alaskan Triangle could be a hub for some sort of supernatural activity? On July 26, 2012, ufologist Linda Moulton Howe announced the discovery of a black pyramid, twice the size of the Great Pyramid of Giza, buried deep underground in Alaska, not very far from Mount McKinley. Moulton Howe made the discovery official on a conspiracy radio show known as Coast to Coast AM. She broadcasted a pre-recorded interview with Douglas Mutchler, a retired U.S. Army counterintelligence officer. Mutchler said that in 1992, China tested a nuclear device in the Northwest Chinese Desert. Apparently, the effects of this were felt all the way in Alaska, where it was first suspected to be an earthquake. Scientists used seismic recording equipment to investigate and apparently discovered an unexplainable structure underground. Mushler claims this was reported to Anchorage Channel 13 News, but when he contacted the broadcaster to follow up and request a copy of the story, he was told the feature never ran, believing it to be a government cover-up. He reached out to Moulton Howe by email in June of 2012. Mushler went on to claim that he had accessed secret files at work after relocating from Alaska to Fort Meade, but apparently was promptly prevented from checking out any further information on those files. He allegedly said that other colleagues said, they don't want us messing with this anymore. Following the radio show, a son of a retired electrical engineer contacted Moulton Howe claiming his father worked on a powerful electric system system for a large underground pyramid of unknown origin between the years of 1959 and 1961. Apparently, his father and his colleagues referred to the structure as the Dark Pyramid. The government was very serious about keeping whatever project this was under wraps. Apparently, this project was a study of electrical distribution. The son went on to say the father would always complain about having to pay electric bills because if the public knew about that project and that that black pyramid could emanate enough electricity to give everybody free electricity for life, he even speculated that it could not only power up that town, but all of Alaska and potentially Canada as well. Admittedly, this story does sound incredibly Harry Potter-ish, but it does have some elements of truth, right? If this was true, why hasn't anybody else from that era who worked in that place come up with any stories from 1992 about that? Why did Mushler wait 20 years to contact Linda? There isn't as much information about this story online as you would expect, suggesting it probably hasn't been taken very seriously. Although it is a topic of discussion on a show called The Alaskan Triangle that did air on the Discovery Channel, some people believe the structure to be of alien origin. While skeptics suggest that Linda made up the entire story to profit, it honestly does seem a little bit too outlandish and very underreported on for it to be super serious. It's interesting and entertaining nonetheless, but I don't know if the credibility is really there.
In 1945, Ivan T. Sanderson, a Scottish biologist and cryptozoologist, published an article called The Twelve Devil's Graveyards Around the World. In this article, he wrote of 12 equally spaced triangles on Earth's surface, where strange things would happen in high frequency. These triangles, known as vile vortices, are characterized by electric, electromagnet, and magnetic abnormalities. These anomalies are thought to be capable of everything from causing compasses and other electrical instruments to malfunction, to triggering confusion and hallucinations in people. Search and rescue workers have reported experiencing auditory hallucinations within the Alaskan Triangle while on their searches. They compare this sound to being similar of that of a swarm of bees. Some people even believe vile vortices to be portals to other realms, dimensions, or even worlds, explaining why ships and aircraft disappear without a trace. The main 12 vile vortices are are the Bermuda Triangle, the Devil's Sea off of Japan, the Algerian Megaliths, the Hamkulia Volcano in Hawaii, the Indus Valley in Pakistan, Easter Island, the Loyalty Islands, the South Atlantic Anomaly, the Zimbabwe Megaliths, the Wharton Basin, and the North and South Poles. Although the Alaskan Triangle isn't a part of these notorious 12, it's widely believed to be an area heavily affected by electromagnetic ley lines. The same can probably be said for England's Stonehenge. Some seem to think that the stones got there in the first place because of the ley lines. This is also said about the other megaliths, such as the Easter Island monoliths, because the origin of these heavy and unique structures are widely unknown. There are also other theories and rumors that aliens could be responsible for many of these things that we see around the world that we don't seem to have answers for. Ley lines and vile vortices are an unproven science, though. There's countless content out there debunking vile vortices as a myth, and of course there is content debunking the debunking. It is one of the more far-fetched theories, but of course it's entirely worth mentioning. Now that we've run through some of the potential reasons for the high number of missing people cases and missing aircraft, you can bear all of this in mind as we cover some mysteries and missing persons reports from the area. On October 16, 1972, a Cessna 310 disappeared without a trace. The plane was carrying 58-year-old U.S. House of Representatives Majority Leader Haley Boggs, 40-year-old Congressman Nick Begich, his aide, 37-year-old Russell Brown, and their pilot, 38-year-old Don Johns. This is actually one of the Alaska Triangle's most prolific cases. That's not very surprising considering two of the passengers were very high profile. This case was actually so prominent, the term, the Alaskan Triangle, was actually coined because of this. The flight departed from Anchorage somewhere around 9 a.m. and was expected to land in Juneau about three and a half hours later, where the politicians were due to attend a rally behind Begich's campaign. The plane had enough fuel for a six-hour flight, so, in theory, they should have been more than well off. When the flight failed to arrive at Juneau, the largest ever U.S. search and rescue mission at the time was conducted. This included over 40 military aircraft and 50 civilian planes. The search covered over 300,000 square miles. According to the flight plan, the Cessna had been set to fly through Portage Pass to Prince William Sound, then along the coast to Yucatan and on to Juneau. The last contact the ground had received with the aircraft was shortly after it departed, indicating the crash more than likely happened earlier in the journey. No wreckage was found in Portage Pass, so officials suspected that the plane probably crashed in Prince William Sound and submerged under the water. There was a new law that required all airplanes to carry a black box. This would transmit its location even upon a crash. This is a much more reliable system if a plane crashes on land, though crashing in the water can cause some sort of issues, especially back in the day. However though, it is believed that this Cessna 310 did not have that box on board. Unfortunately, the law didn't come into full effect until December of 1972. The search officially ended on December 24th and the men were all declared dead on December 29th. To this day, 
no trace of the plane or its passengers have ever been found. The flight was operated by a Pan-Alaska Airways company, which was owned by Don Johns, apparently. He was an Army veteran and an experienced pilot, with more than 17,000 hours of flying under his belt. I did have a hard time finding images of the other two on this craft. The amount of experience the pilot had makes the disappearance of the plane just a little bit more puzzling. Johns was a competent pilot, and Anchorage to Juneau is a very common flight path. It's not like they were traveling to and from an obscure location. However, the weather conditions were marginal at best, with fog, turbulent wind, ice fog, and icy rain in the forecast en route, some speculate that Johns may have gone ahead with the trip against his better judgment, following the pressure from high-profile occupants. Obviously, he wanted to get them to the rally on time. But on the other hand, it's really not usual for pilots to fly in those types of conditions. It's incredibly dangerous, especially in climates like Alaska. Basically, most pilots would have waited for more optimum conditions. So while it's very possible the plane hit a mountain hidden by fog or crashed due to turbulent conditions and became buried in snow or ice or lost deep underwater in the Prince William Sound, some have theorized there could be a more sinister reason behind the flight's disappearance. Haley Boggs was a colorful character. He was expected to eventually become Speaker of the House, the third most powerful position in American politics. He was also somewhat controversial. He was a Democrat, re-elected to Congress in Louisiana 13 times. He was also a member of the Warren Commission, which investigated the assassination of John F. Kennedy and found Lee Harvey Oswald had acted alone. There were rumors that Boggs wasn't in agreement and sought to reopen the case. Although he publicly defended the findings and the case was never reopened, Boggs' car was reportedly run off the road in 1970, and he claimed his phone was being tapped by the FBI. Although he didn't disclose the reasons for this, he called for the resignation of the FBI director, J. Edgar Hoover. It seems a bit of a stretch to assume this relates to the Cessna's disappearance, but there are conspiracy theories that Boggs was the victim of a targeted attack. Freelance writer Jonathan Walzak has thoroughly investigated this case. He believes that if the Cessna was sabotaged, Begich was more than likely the intended target than Boggs. Although Begich wasn't well known politically outside of Alaska, there is more plausible theories placing him as the primary target. Less than 17 months after Begich's death, as widow Peggy Begich married, married Jerry Max Pasley, a man with connections in organized crime. The marriage lasted just two years. Pasley was later imprisoned for murder after shooting a man in Tucson. In 1994, while behind bars, he claimed he was responsible for transporting a bomb to Anchorage, an explosive that took down the plane carrying his ex-wife's first husband. Pasley said he didn't know what was in the locked briefcase he was transporting to Anchorage, only that something big would happen. After Begich's disappearance, Pasley moved to Anchorage and dated Peggy Begich, who he had previously met through mutual friends and dated before the Cessna's disappearance. Pasley claimed Peggy gave him co-ownership of a bar. His co-owners were Peggy and one of the men he had handed the briefcase to in Anchorage. On a fishing trip, this man revealed to Pasley that the suitcase contained the bomb planted on the plane carrying Boggs and Begich. While Zach's research presents Pasley's claims as plausible. However, we can't know whether Pasley is telling the truth that an explosive device was responsible for the plane's disappearance, but it adds another layer to mystery that will almost certainly remain unsolved. Tomas Marco Seibold was a German native, but spent the prior six years before his disappearance living in Wisconsin. He taught at the Teaching Drum Outdoor School, located in the Shawamigan Nicolet National Forest of northern Wisconsin. The school is actually really cool. It teaches Native American values and skills to survive in the outdoors. You can learn such useful skills as weather forecasting, shelter building, hunting, and foraging, plus many, many more. Seibold would spend days up to weeks in the winter wilderness sometimes, camping in handmade shelters, and hunting for prey to not only cook but make clothing out of. In the summer, he would even stay out there in the wilderness for months at a time. He was generally described as a kind, loving, 
warm-hearted soul, he spent much of his time working at the school under its founder, Temarak Song, who described Siebold as being a wandering spirit and an experienced outdoorsman. In 2012, Siebold would take a six-month leave to visit Alaska. He started at a native fish camp in the southeast before traveling north on the Tanana River near Fairbanks. After arriving in the northwestern village of Ambler, he trekked approximately 30 more miles up the Ambler River to apparently stay with a friend of Tamarack Song. Apparently it would be this friend and their 13-year-old son. Their home is located in Brooks Range, which is just outside the Arctic National Park, where apparently Seibold was planning to visit next. Gates of the Arctic National Park is actually probably one of the most dangerous parks in the entire planet. It is the northernmost point of Alaska and it is the least visited national park in the country. With that said though, it is also the second largest park with over 8,472,000 acres. Of course, this park lies inside the Arctic Circle, so it's very cold, the terrain can be very treacherous, and the animals that like to live there and call it home can be, uh, very competitive, if you know what I mean. The park contains part of the Brooks Range Mountains. There are no roads in or out of the park due to its seclusion. This, combined with what we already know about the Alaskan wilderness, cannot be a good mix. This should give us a very good idea of the potential dangers Seibold was facing when hiking in this area. But as all accounts seem to note, he was an experienced and competent outdoorsman who should have been able to deal with this. He had already spent months living in the outdoors in the Alaskan climate. Apparently, back in Norway, he'd even camped in negative 25 degree weather, so he was somewhat equipped for the cold, to say the least. On September 27, 2002, Tomas set off for the gates of the Arctic National Park. He planned to hike 30 miles to reach the town of Kobuk by November 10th, if possible. From there, he would fly back to Fairbanks and then back home to Wisconsin, somewhere around November 15th. Police were contacted on the 11th when Seibold did not return. He failed to turn up for his flight, and he didn't get in contact with anybody letting them know where he was or what was going on. The search was initially focused on the Ambler River and Ulanique Creek, because this is where Seibold was believed to have set up his base camp. His diary was found, located in a cabin, last dated October 7th. He wrote about exploring up higher in the mountains and preparing the cabin for a harsh winter, indicating he did plan to come back, but apparently never made it. Unfortunately, there weren't any clues in the diary or the cabin that gave any any clues to his precise whereabouts. On November 20th, state troopers started using six-seater planes for the search instead of two-seater planes, giving them many more eyes to survey the ground. The six-seater Piper Navajo was also more capable of flying in the winds and the harsh conditions of Alaska making it much easier to search the highlands, where apparently Tomas's diary said he would be going. After three days of searching, a circle was eventually discovered. It was located on a gravel bar very far up the Ambler River, around eight miles north of Ulanique Creek. Searchers were thinking that this may be an O from an SOS, but a ground search would once again yield no more clues. There was absolutely nothing to connect this circle to Seibold, unfortunately. And even if he had drawn it, he may have simply just been marking his own supplies. The official search was suspended on November 24th. There had been no significant leads and falling temperatures were making it even harder to continue the search. Friends and family kept looking, of course, and they privately hired a search and rescue team to come in. They had hired specifically two of the bush pilots who had already been working on the case for the state. Unfortunately, no trace of Seibold was found and he was declared dead in 2013. It's quite possible that Tomas got injured or died of hypothermia while out there. Again, Alaska is one hell of an unforgiving landscape. Even though he had so much experience in these types of landscapes, many people think that it's not possible for that to have happened, but nature always has different plans, and it takes one small slip up for your whole life to end. An animal attack is possible, but so far there has been no evidence suggesting that. But we can't rule out these types of things. Absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. A lot of people speculating are saying that the wildlife theory probably isn't the strongest as most bears and stuff like that were in hibernation. That means there would be a much less bear threat to worry about. But again, you never know. There was some controversy around the search and rescue efforts, of course. State troopers were accused of failing to enlist help in an adequate manner. Apparently, they refused to enlist the help of local Native Americans who 
who would have known the land much better than them. Village search and rescue volunteers claimed they were never asked to help. They were apparently never even told that somebody was missing in their area. Although eventually some did hear about this story and took it upon themselves to go searching. Native locals have a large amount of experience and a wealth of knowledge of these areas. So their expertise is vital in finding people that may be missing. It really is a shame the state troopers didn't utilize this more. A collaborative effort between state troopers and locals could have resulted in a much more thorough search. A major setback and challenge for the rescuers in this story in particular is that we just did not know what path Tomas had taken. We knew the general area he was supposed to be in, but there could be multiple ways to get there. 10, 15, 20 different routes, if you will. The fact of the matter with Tomas is that he wasn't expected to be back for over a month when he set off for the gates of the Arctic National Park. So he could have been in trouble far sooner than we realize, and it would have been covered up by snow, animals, or whatever else could be out there. You know, sometimes cases do end up getting solved years down the line, and maybe this will be one of them. Forty-eight-year-old Sharon Gay Buse lived in Juneau since around the year 2004. She was an experienced hiker and enjoyed a very active lifestyle. She had even cycled from Canada to Alaska before and had just come back from a backpacking trip in Greenland. Sharon worked as a physical therapist. She also ran a personal business and was shipping orthopedic chairs to customers from Alaska Marine Lines, a business located in downtown Juneau. On the morning of May 23rd, 2014, this was where she was last seen. She was wearing bright colored sports clothing, although some sources do mention that her clothing is unknown, perhaps because she could have changed between downtown and her hiking trip. She had a black cast on her left hand. She was five foot eight, brown hair, blue eyes. She had scars on her knee, left hand, shoulder, and knees. She had tattoos on her upper left arm and shoulder, and also had an orthopedic screw implanted into her body. Sharon was reported missing the next day on May 24th by her hiking partner, Ann Johnson, after she failed to show up to a hike with the Juneau Alpine Club, of which they were both members. They had planned to meet at 9 a.m. to hike down Hawthorne Peak, and it was unlike Sharon to not show up and let anyone know she wouldn't be making it. Ann was so concerned that later that day, she even left a wedding reception early to search around the trails of Juneau for their friend. She would eventually find Sharon's car parked at Mount Roberts Trailhead at about 9.30 p.m. The official search for Sharon began on 1 a.m. on May 25th. This included Alaskan State Troopers, Southeast Alaska Dogs, the U.S. Coast Guard, and of course the Alpine Club, as well as friends and family members. The search was initially focused on the Mount Juneau and Mount Roberts trail systems. The next day, the search was expanded expanded to include the backcountry as well. The day after that, the search was once again focused back on Mount Juneau and Mount Roberts. The Coast Guard scoured the area by helicopter, but thermal and night vision devices didn't seem to pick up anything at all. Aerial searches were carried out over the areas that couldn't safely be trekked by foot. For example, Granite Creek Basin, Mount Roberts Ridgeline, and Sheep Creek Drainage. Snowy conditions made the search increasingly more difficult day by day. Luckily though, a dog would pick up Sharon's scent though. Apparently near where her car was parked on the Mount Roberts trailhead, other dogs also showed interest in that general area as well. But the handlers couldn't be certain that they were actually reacting to the scent of Sharon. After finding no significant leads, the search was suspended after just four days. Sharon's friends and family feel like that was premature. Nothing to suggest foul play was found in Sharon's home. Her overnight camping bag was left at her house, so we can safely say she wasn't planning on staying overnight. A handheld emergency GPS was also found at her house as well. It really is a shame she didn't take this with her. Her cell phone was not found, so presumably we can say she took that with her. But unfortunately, the phone company was not able to track her location, meaning her phone was likely dead, turned off, or damaged. A hiker reported seeing a bear in the Glory Hole Basin area. Apparently, this is towards the end of the Perseverance hiking trail. This hiker also mentioned a foul odor, leading him to believe a bear might have come across a body or killed someone themselves. State troopers did send a small search team to that area, but nothing was found. 
There is nothing that really suggests that this has anything to do with Sharon Buse. If the bear had stumbled upon something, it could have been an animal or even another missing person. In August 2014, Brian Weed, a local man with experience exploring local mine shafts, led a small team who searched for Sharon in the abandoned mine shafts around the area. But like previous searches, unfortunately nothing would turn up Sharon's whereabouts. It really is a mystery what happened to Sharon. Although she is an experienced hiker, everyone is susceptible to an accident or Mother Nature deciding it doesn't want to be your friend that day. As mentioned before, she did have an injured hand with a cast on it, so that could have also been something that helped her downfall and being able to protect herself. Misadventure is likely the case of Sharon's disappearance here, but we can never be too sure here. There are countless terrors and mishaps that can go down on the Mount Roberts Trail. She could have ventured off trail as well and gotten in some trouble. An animal attack is less likely, but always possible. There is also a chance that she was abducted from the Mount Roberts Trailhead before she even made it to her hike. This would explain why the search was so unsuccessful, but scent dogs were hitting on her scent in the beginning of the trail. We can only hope that a new lead will pop up in the future that will help us further this case. And if that does happen, don't worry, I will be sure to make an update video. Unfortunately, a lot of missing persons cases aren't really reported in the media. Whether it be due to lack of details or just people not really having any updates to share very often, it could be argued that missing persons cases do outnumber prime time slots on television. But it's still frustrating for family and friends to not be able to get fair coverage and adequate coverage. It doesn't seem right on a human level sometimes. But to end this video, I'm going to cover some lesser known cases with less detail than the typical case I would cover, because these are all human beings with lives, souls, families, and people who need to know what happened to them. Most of the information on these cases I'm going to share with you came from projects like The Charlie Project. This is a website that lists people who go missing all the time. They're usually funded by crowds like us, so if you guys would like to go over there, donate a dollar or two to help them with their cause, that would be very cool. Now, while Charlie Project doesn't investigate these cases, they do create a hub for people to be able to do that much easier and much more streamlined. In June 2000, a wallet, driver's license, Illinois state identification card, and checkbook belonging to Dervish Adili were found at a campsite near Taylor Highway. Adili was a 35-year-old, 5'7 Caucasian male with brown hair and brown eyes. He would be in his late 60s if still alive today. There are a few unsettling details about this case. A receipt for food items purchased in Toke was found with Adili's identification. This receipt was dated August 13, 1992, so had he already been missing for eight years by the time his belongings were discovered? A male relative reported Adili missing in 2006. This begs the question of why it took so long for him to be reported missing, and what action did authorities take in the six years between finding his possessions and his relative making the missing person report? Reddit users and internet sleuths have attempted to investigate this case. I won't go into it here because a lot of their findings are speculation and not backed up by sources. Cases like this remind us of the importance of checking in on friends and family members that live solitary lives and making sure that they have someone to whom they can feel they can report their movements for safety reasons. Thirty-six-year-old Albert Agathluk was a 5'5 Native American with black hair and brown eyes. He would be 52 if still alive today. He is believed to have been wearing a black Carhartt jacket with brown pants and black gloves. He left Emirak, a city of the Kolsavak census area, on his snow machine at 4 p.m. on November 16, 2006. He was going to the nearby city of Alakanak, but he never arrived. Searchers found his snow machine in the Yukon River. There was a hole in the ice and his white bunny boots and one of his black gloves were found in the water. His family later confirmed these were his belongings. He is thought to have fallen through the ice and drowned, but as his body hasn't been found, his disappearance officially remains unsolved. Cora Anderson, a 51-year-old Caucasian female, was last seen leaving their Eureka Lodge at mile 128 off Glen Highway in Palmer on July 16, 1979. Her vehicle was found abandoned nine days later at Moose Creek Campground around 70 miles away at mile 58 off Glen Highway, but there was no trace of Cora herself and her case remains unsolved. 
She'd be 94 years old to still alive today. She is believed to have been wearing a black turtleneck sweater, black slacks, a purple jacket, black shoes, eyeglasses, and, and possibly gold nugget jewelry, including a gold watch with a black and jade band. Fifty-six-year-old Earl Ashworth and four friends went to explore a gold mine near mile marker 56 of the Seward Highway south of Anchorage on August 10, 2018. He stayed behind with his 10-year-old dog Cruiser while his friends went into the mine. Cruiser was alone when the others returned. Ashworth was a 6'2 Caucasian male with blonde hair and blue eyes. He was wearing blue jeans, rubber boots, and a blue t-shirt with cut-off sleeves and the American Eagle emblem on the front. Some resources claim that he walked away, but details about this case are limited and it doesn't say how they know he walked off. Is it possible he was abducted? If he did walk away voluntarily, why? Did he see something or did someone call out to him? These are the questions that currently don't have answers. Rory Victor Banhart went missing from Ketchikan in December 2014. Banhart, a Caucasian male about 5 foot 3 in height, was 38 at the time of his disappearance. He'd now be 46. He took a taxi to the 49er Bar on Water Street on December 29th. He planned to take a taxi home afterwards, but he was drunk and verbally abusive, so the driver asked him to get out. It's not known what happened to him after that. He had been out of contact for short periods prior to his disappearance, but never for a significant length of time. And there was no activity on his bank cards or cell phone after December 29th. Ketchikan is a city on the Revillagetto Island and is accessible by only boat or plane. There is no record of him taking either off of the island. His family heard a disturbing rumor that he had been shot to death but I couldn't find any evidence to support this, and the police think it's more likely he either fell in the water or succumbed to the elements. In a vigil held in early 2016 attended by 125 people, a family friend read aloud a letter written by Banhart's cousin Irene Anderson. She wrote, There are many family members hurting because he is no longer here. We may never know how Roy's journey of life came to an end, but we'll pray that his spirit rest in peace along with other family members in heaven. Let us remember others that are missing, Gary Hamilton, Justin Nathan, and Thomas Booth, and pray they're all found, and the truth will come out about each loss. A scripture was read from a Bible that belonged to Thomas William Booth, a 35-year-old man who went missing in the Ketchikan area on January 2, 2016 after he went out to run errands and never returned. His body was sadly found five months later beneath a fishing processing plant. Although the cause and manner of death weren't released, Police Chief Alan Bengard said the body appeared to have been in the water for a substantial length of time and was pushed underneath the plant by a high tide. Although it's a heartbreaking outcome, hopefully it's given his friends and family some closure. At the vigil, a message Thomas Booth had written in his Bible was read out loud. It said, Air to breathe, water to drink, food to eat, people to love, and God to praise. Life can be pretty simple if you break it down to what's really important. This feels like the right place to end this video. I know it's been a long one, so thank you for sticking with me to the end. I would love to know your thoughts about the Alaskan Triangle in the comments. I asked a few days before finishing this video up on my community page on YouTube what your thoughts were. I said I would add a few that I liked into the end of the video, so popping up on screen right now you'll see various comments from viewers just like you. If you'd like me to do this further, be sure to comment yours down below and I'll add it to the next video. If you enjoyed this video and want to see more like this from me, be sure to subscribe. It helps me out a ton and turn on notifications to not miss a new video as I upload them almost every single day. I have tons of cases already like this on the channel and many more coming. Be sure to hit that like button as it helps this video grow, leave a comment, and I'll see you soon with another creepy episode.